if we look at um, childhood in North America right now, we can see that it's seriously uh, under threat. We can see that in the numbers of kids being diagnosed with all kinds of uh, uh, behavioral, developmental, and um, mental problems. We can see it in the millions of kids that are being medicated. We can see it in the statistics that show that as many as 50% of uh, American adolescents meet the diagnostic criteria for one or another mental health disorder at some time during their teenage years. We can see it in the frustration of parents who uh, believe and experience that they've lost the power to somehow bring up their kids according to their own um, values. The, the impotence that many parents experience in the face of the culture. We can see it in the terrible situations in the schools where um, kids are not learning how to read and write as they did decades ago. And uh, then in the aggression in the, in the culture and the, and the drug use and so on. And if we're seeing this, on, on so, the, all these problems arise on such a broad scale, we really have to ask what's going on. And it's not enough to blame individuals, individual kids for behaving badly or parents for not parenting properly. Because if that was the problem, we'd see individual cases here or there. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't see um, these problems manifest on such a widespread social level. And if we are seeing that, then we have to ask what's going on in society. And particularly, well, if you were looking at a plant that wasn't developing properly in your garden, you wouldn't start blaming it for making the wrong choice. You would ask what conditions are lacking. Soil, irrigation, sunlight. Now, similar with childhood development. So essentially, the question we have to ask is, what conditions do children, do children need for healthy development? And what conditions are available to them today? Now, recent research done here in the States actually shows that the optimal environment for child rearing are hunter-gatherer societies. Now, that doesn't mean we all, we all have to become hunters and gatherers. That's not going to happen. But what is it about those societies that facilitates healthy human development? Well, what it is, is the attachment relationship of parents to adults. And what you have in those societies are not just isolated parents living in a nuclear family setting, separate from extended family, separate from clan, separate from culture. But what you have is what the African saying asserts, it takes a whole village to raise a child. So children were meant to be parented in a much broader um, adult set of relationships, number one. Uh, number two, if you look at what the brain development of the child requires, I'm talking about the physiological development of key, bra key brain circuits to do with stress responses, emotional self-regulation, impulse control, attention, decision-making, picking up on social cues. Those essential brain circuits for their physiological development require the presence of non-stressed, emotion available, attuned parenting caregivers. So what, do you, what, do you then have, in a, what have you got in a society that uh, destroys the village in a sense of the emotional attachments of children to many adults that for the most part separates kids from their parents much of the time owing to economic pressures that stresses the parents um, inordinately, so that even when they're with their kids, they're very stressed and distracted. When 20% of women now suffer postpartum depression, where the maternity leave length for many women in, in, is six weeks, what can you expect in a society like that? Or you expect all kinds of dysfunction, maldevelopment, and behaviors that manifest severe emotional losses which then typically we mistake for behavioral problems. But we're not talking about behavioral problems, we're talking about relationship problems between the child and the adult. And by making it a behavior issue, 
by trying to stop the behavior, we make the problem worse because we end up punishing these kids and attacking them and, and uh, uh, further eroding their relationship with us and their trust in us. As a result of all that, another dynamic that follows is that children who are programmed biologically to connect to somebody, they can't help it. They must attach to somebody. Their brains are telling them to. And consider for a moment how important attachment, which is to say closeness with another human being, is to even adults. And what happens to us as adults when our closest attachment relationships are threatened and how disoriented and how upset we become? Well, the child is much more that way because he's much more dependent. She's much more um, vulnerable and helpless. So they can't abide not having attachments. But who will they attach to? Well, who's around? Well, who's around in our culture are the kids. So apart from losing their nurturing relationship with adults because of the pressures and, and social factors I've already outlined, then kids become connected to other kids. So for the first time in history now, you have immature creatures influencing each other inordinately. The, the result is immaturity, all kinds of behavioral problems, all kinds of um, uh, interferences with ne healthy development, and a whole range of uh, uh, behavioral learning and mental health issues. So this is what I mean. The culture is meant to maintain our attachments and to give us a place where we actually belong and where we can be supported. That's the traditional role of culture. Nature can only program us to be attached and to be connected, but nature can't provide the culture. That's up to society to do that. Now what happens in a culture when the rate of change is so rapid we can't even adapt to it? It means that we are disoriented, we, are, we lose our bearings, we lose our connections with one another, with our kids, and the result is what I began to uh, delineate in the beginning, all these childhood problems, behavior issues, mental health issues, and a whole range of other problems, which of course manifest on the individual level and of course on a social level. And on top of that, then we have this culture uh, in a narrower sense, uh, which that, that is to say the media, which reinforces those trends. Interestingly enough, if you look at most TV programs aimed at kids, adults aren't even in them. Or if they are, they're only present as laughable peripheral figures. And it's just all about the, the experience of the, of the kids as separate from adults. So the culture reinforces then our separation from our kids. And on top of that then, we've given our kids all this technology by which they can now compulsively connect with one another, even when they're not in each other's physical presence. And so you got the Twittering and the tweeting and the text messaging and the emailing and the Skyping and the cell phoning. And you have essentially an alien peer culture that stands in separation and very often um, in opposition to the, um, the healthy culture that adults would like to pass on to their kids, but they've lost the power to do so because they've lost the connection. In short, what we've got is developmental disaster. <clears throat> Parents in a hunter-gatherer society don't have to know anything about attachment. Just like we don't have to know about gravity to walk on the earth. Gravity will just take care of us because it's there. Now, in societies where the attachment relationships are still working, the parents don't have to be aware of it. But in a society where it's no longer the dominant dynamic, in a sense of the culturally supported dominant dynamic, we have to become conscious of attachments because the culture is forever undermining our attachments. So that the first thing is that parents really have to be aware of the importance of attachment. They have to be aware of it from the moment that the woman gets pregnant. Because already the woman's attachment relationships, if they're working, will protect her from stress. And if they're not working, they will add to her stress. And already the stresses on the pregnant woman have an impact on the development of the child. And then when it comes to birthing, again, the attachment relationship needs to be um, vouchsafed the attachment relationship of, 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 of parent to child, of mother to infant. 
And what we've got instead is a highly medicalized birth culture in which increasingly people don't even give birth naturally anymore. And then there's more and more medical interference, separation instead of bonding. Well, that, if we were conscious of it, would make us rethink our birthing practices. And then you have a society in which maternity leave is six weeks very often. And whereas in any kind of rational culture, uh, society would provide support for parents to stay at home with their kids. So instead of making it more difficult, we would actually facilitate it. And then we would support natural parenting practices, such as, for example, this breastfeeding, which is now a minority activity in this country. A relative minority of women breastfeed past a couple of months, and some of them never breastfeed at all. And yet that breastfeeding dynamic is essential, not just from the immunological, because of the antibodies that you pass on, and the nutritional, because of the nutrients that the breast milk contains, but also from the emotional bonding perspective. Especially for the human infant, who is uh, helpless and immature for much longer, basically we're born much more prematurely than other mammals are, which means that the connection needs to be even closer for longer. And the, uh, the uh, British anthropologist Ashley Montague coined the phrase exterogestation to balance interogestation. Interogestation is gestation inside the uterus. But he said that fundamentally for the human beings to achieve the same level of development as other animals do at birth, we have to be externally gestated for another nine months. And that would, that would, that would naturally, where possible, which it is in most cases, include breastfeeding. And then on top of that, we'd have to be aware that the more we stress people, the more that stress translates into neurological influences on the um, brains of their kids. So stressed parents are much more likely to have kids with ADHD and other problems. Stressed parents are more likely to have kids with asthma, according to research literature. Clearly, for, for, for reasons that are very obvious that I haven't got time to go into in this conversation, but physiologically they're straightforward. On and on and on, and what I'm saying is that the essential quality here is to be aware of attachment and its importance and to maintain that attachment as much as possible and to protect it and to hold it safe and sacred throughout the child's development, which lasts well into the teenage years. In the face of the cultural messages that attachment is not important, that kids need other kids more than they need adults, uh, and all this kind of stuff. So the primary answer to your question as to what's necessary, it's consciousness of attachment. Thank mm -hmm. you.